Hi. In this episode, you'll learn how to judge any wine in three sips from one of my favorite people in the wine business. First, you'll hear the story of how my guest went from being an editor of a commercial real estate magazine to one of the most sought after wine educators in the United States. A story that I find fascinating, but if you want to get right to the sipping, feel free to skip ahead about 10 minutes. Here we go. This is the Inside Wine Podcast. I'm Joe Janish, a certified specialist of wine and wine industry professional since 1996, giving you insider tips to make the right wine decisions. Today, our guest is Anthony Giglio. And if you haven't heard of Anthony Giglio, he is kind of like the edutainer of the wine business. He's been a sommelier. He's been a journalist, an author, lecturer. He's written for Esquire, Food and Wine Magazine, Departures, Travel and Leisure, dozens of others. He's written books on wine and cocktails. Probably one of the most entertaining people I've ever met in the wine industry, kind of like a dash of Bill Nye, the science guy, plus Bruce Springsteen, and maybe a a little bit of, I don't know, Frank Sinatra. Anthony, thank you so much for joining me today on the Inside Wine Podcast. Joe, I'm so excited to be here. Don't feel too humbled. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The the thing that Anthony does so well is, Anthony, you just do such a great job of kind of like breaking down wine and making it easy for people because wine can be so damn complicated and... I feel like you do such a great job of making it easy for people and not so intimidating. And maybe you could just give me an idea of like how you got to here at first, because it's, it's so fascinating to me that someone could be such a good teacher and yet make wine so much fun. Because usually when people are teaching about wine, you, you kind of want to fall asleep. But maybe you could give me just a little background on how you got to doing this and the way you're doing it now. That's a great question. I'm a journalist first, so uh, I went to Fordham University here in New York, right at Lincoln Center, and I didn't know what I wanted to write about. And this is this is such ancient history, but in the late '80s, you know, there were very few men's magazines. I wanted to be a magazine writer. Uh, It was basically for men. It was either GQ or Esquire, and this is when magazines really mattered. And to to land in one of them would be you know a humongous big deal. But it would all, you know, what, what was my specialty? I don't know. I guess it would be lifestyle. I mean, we, we definitely weren't talking about booze the way we talk about it today. But I wound up going to travel and leisure as my first job uh, right out of college. And it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. And I didn't last very long because I had been spoiled by my internships at PC Magazine, where I was actually able to really edit and run copy and literally cut and paste using an X-Acto knife and sticky paper and moving lines around. And then I go to travel and leisure where I'm relegated to sharpening pencils and coffee, running for coffee. And I do have a screenplay I've written about that, which is called When I Was He-Mail, which is before email existed. Um, I literally ran around with stapled post-its from office to office, floor to floor, running messages. It was as humiliating as it sounds. And I didn't last. I quit after six months. And I wound up at a real estate trade magazine called National Real Estate Investor, which sounds as horrific as it was, but I actually learned how to write and edit and run seven departments for this very actually successful real estate, commercial real estate magazine, but it was a trade. But my editor there, Dora Hattress, I owe her a lot of um, my career because she knew I didn't belong there. She was 10 years older than me and she was single. And I, that's a, I bring up that point because we'd usually wind up in her office in the morning with coffee and she'd smoke because you could smoke back then in offices. And she would say like, so I went on a date last night. I would tell about my dating life. And there was always wine in my stories. And she said one day, why aren't you writing about wine? And I said, because I'm not a retired lawyer at, and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, exactly. or, and I'm not British. Not you know, deca- I had decanter and the spectator in mind. And, uh, and she said, which is exactly why we need a 22 year old to write about wine. And um, I kind of like you know, I let it sit there for a bit. And then I swear the way this happens, Joe, this is the way this stuff happens. Um, within a probably three weeks of that conversation, I worked over at Five Penn Plaza, which is next to the, the Farley Post Office, uh, just across from the garden. And I would sit on the post office steps and have Chinese food or whatever lunch I grabbed. But I was reading Details, which was brand new at the time. And it was, this is the fall of 1991. And it says 92 careers for 92. And one was become a sommelier 
meet chicks. And I was like, interesting. And so like, I went back to my office and I, I, whenever I tell this story, I, t- I go back to Fordham and tell like my journalism class there. Cause my teacher is, my professor Elizabeth Stone is still at Fordham teaching journalism and she'll call us in every now and then to, to show off her students. And I'll say, you know, and I went back to my office and I called information because there was no internet yet and found the sommelier society in New York city that was mentioned in this article. And I left a message and they called me back and said, why don't you come and, and join the class next Tuesday? And, and I said, great, I'll be there. And she said, it starts at noon. And I went, what? And she said, it's for the trade. So I went back to Dora and I said, remember that idea you had? I want to get my diploma at this, this uh, it would be a, back then it would be called diploma in service. And it gave you a, an edge on restaurant jobs. But I just wanted to learn the vocabulary and how to taste. But I had to take this diploma course. And she said, I'll make a deal with you. If you can shut your big fat mouth and not tell a soul, I will cover for you on Tuesdays from 12. And it would be the whole afternoon gone. So she said, you leave a, you leave a jacket on your chair. We'll, make, we'll leave boards and shuffle things. And I'll say, I sent you off to the printer or the typecast or whoever. And you will make it up by not leaving for lunch the rest of the week. So forget the post office steps going forward. And you stay at your desk this way. If we get caught, you're covered that you put up, you put the hours back in. And we did that for a year and it worked. And then she comes back to me after I got my diploma. And by the way, my teacher was Roger Dagorn, Roger. Oh, as, Roger Dagorn, yeah. yeah. Back then he was at um, Chanterelle. We did the classes at a Chinese place in the East 50s called Se Yang, which at the time, and this is like 1991, was one of the best restaurants, Chinese restaurants in the city, fine dining restaurants, I should say, for Chinese. That's where the classes were. And when I finish, she comes and brings me an ad from the New York Times and says, please tell me you answered this already. And I said, what is it? And she said, it's a, it's a metropolitan area wine magazine seeks managing editor. And I said, I would never have answered that. It's managing editor. I'm like still an editorial assistant. And she said, in the wine world, how big could the hierarchy be? Call him now. <laughs> it was Tish, W.R. Tishman oh, Tish, from Wine Enthusiast. And I went up and interviewed and I got the job. And he said to me, basically, listen, Anthony, you manage no one. It's me and you. But I was trying to attract anybody to come and work here. And, you know, it'll be me and you and you'll learn a lot and it'll open doors. And then, you know, you, you know, stick around a few years and you go from here. And that's, that's exactly what I did. I lasted two years and it open doors. And from there, it's just been, you know, a a good run for 25 years about writing about wine. And one thing I didn't mention, this goes back to John, the king of tangents. But while I was working at Wine Enthusiast, I then went to work for Kevin's Rayleigh at night at Windows on the World. And I worked there for two years. He kept me on and put me in the private wine club. Alec Bruff was running the, uh, the, the Cellar in the Sky, which was the private wine club. And I was working with all these great sommeliers and we would get to taste insanely great wines. But it was from Kevin that I learned how to make it fun because there is no more dynamic wine teacher in the country than Kevin Zraeli. Um, and he's still at it. And then probably within a year or two meeting Kevin, I met Josh Wesson, who is probably one of the funniest sommeliers on the planet. And especially back then, I didn't know anybody. I had nothing to compare. I, was, I had just come learning from the tuxedoed French master sommeliers of the great old New York guard. And so Josh is like literally the Shecky Green of, of wine comedians. So I learned, I think if, if I could attribute my style 10 minutes after you asked the question to anybody, it's I'm the love child of Kevin Zraeli and Josh Wesson, if, <laughs> if there is such a thing. <laughs> there you go. And so I, I threw away 80% of what Roger taught me. Sorry, Roger, but uh, it was way too, like nobody cares about the subsoils of the Rheingau unless you're a master psalm. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, and it's, it's information that's important to wrap your head around. But then when you're trying to convey that to consumers, which is my entire career is talking to consumers, you only need 10% of that to really get people to connect. And what I've, you know, let's use a cheesy metaphor, what I've distilled it down to, Joe, is that people really just want permission to like what they like, to admit what they like, right, to the likes of me, because people hate to tell me what they like to drink. And I always joke and say, relax, there is only one wrong answer, and that is white Zinfandel. (laughs) And I will take a hit for that, and I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. But otherwise, like it's, it's, it, I, I've learned that people really just want to talk about what they, you know, they want to not feel stupid. They don't want to be made to, to feel like there's a right answer. That's what it always comes down to. Like people always say, like, well, what do I know? You're the expert. And I'm like, you are the expert of your own palate. Let's change the, the, the noun from wine to coffee. 
And if we were at Starbucks and, I, and there's 10 people on a, uh, at, a, at a wine tasting, let's pretend we have 10 cups of coffee and you're all allowed to go to the Starbucks sidebar and put whatever you want from there into your coffee. You come back to the table. There's not one person at this table who has the same cup of coffee. And then I'll usually make fun of like whoever my confederate is at the table, like it's you. I would say, you know, I want the double espresso black. Joe likes a frappuccino with sprinkles. And that's what makes the world go round. And like, but like people's, you know, you see shoulders go down. Yeah. You know, I also explain that I'm a blue collar kid from Jersey City whose parents, you know, did questionable things in the 70s that it will preclude me from ever becoming president. But and my nickname in the family is Fancy Pants. But <laughs> I always, always keep that in mind that like that's the ultimate relaxer. When I say, uh, my name is Anthony Giglio and I'm from Jersey City, New Jersey. Anybody got a problem with that? You just see like the, the like people are appalled and really, really entertained by that. Like, oh my God. Like, th- and that's, that just sets the, the pace because people expect you to be a hoity-toity sommelier. That they can't even pronounce it half the time. It's usually sommelier from Somalia. <laughs> and I say, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just, you know, wine expert, whatever you want to call me. But like, the truth is, I take the wind out of wine and say, like, let's let's never get carried away remembering that this is fermented grape juice. Let's just keep it there and build from there. And that's pretty much the essence of what I do. And and I think that's what sets me apart is that I have the street cred, so I'm not just a big goofball. But I do insist that we have fun with this and not take it too seriously because there's always the blowhard on there who wants to talk about their cellar with 10,000 bottles and I'm the one who reminds them that I will be at the estate sale buying all of that wine that they're hoarding like trophies and offer their kids five bucks a bottle and that really stops the conversation (laughs) in its tracks. Yeah, well that's what I mean. Like You are a wine expert for sure but I think you're a better term maybe wine empowerer if that's actually a word. I like that. I like that better than, by the way, I, I've been, I've been asked, uh, what do you think about the term edutainer? And it just makes me crush, you know, cr- like, because uh, it is, it's a, it's a weirdly, you know, it's a weirdly morphed word. But yeah. It is what it is actually pretty accurate because I, I entertain people. I draw them out. I get them to, to, to talk and to relax and to feel confident to t- trust their palates, trust their own instincts. Because like, like, Joe, it's the other thing to say too, like if we were at a wine dinner together or just having dinner, and we look around the table like, uh, you know, and we're all getting burgers. Who's having medium rare? Who's having it bleeding? Who's having a hockey puck? Like, you know, like, you know your palate. And if you're not afraid to ask for the well done hockey puck, I don't know what you're embarrassed to talk about wine because we should start with the hockey puck and work backwards. Right? Yeah, no, you're right. And, and it, it is exactly what you said. If, if you like a hamburger a certain way, if you like a, a coffee a certain way, like, you know that. No one's going to tell you, you know, you like you know, a certain kind of Java mix, whatever it is. But still people, they they still have that kind of like feeling like they should know more than they should. I, I like something that I've, I've seen you do a lot of times just to help people understand what they like and whether or not they'll like it. And it's, it's how to judge a wine in three sips. I've seen you do this many times. I would love for you to go through this for our listener who might not have seen this or heard this from you, because I think it's such an, a really empowering way to help people understand how they can, you know, judge a wine for themselves and not have, you know, some critic tell them, well, this is 98 points, therefore you should love it. Like it's more of a, you know, again, more of an empowering thing. So why don't you walk us through how you judge a wine in three sips? So whenever I start a tasting, I know that everyone's eager to get started. I got um, this critical suggestion from Food & Wine magazine for, uh, they would send, you know, spies into the, uh, the seminars at the Food & Wine Classic in Aspen. Um, it would be like, you know, some junior editor who I might have never met or, or somebody on the team would be in the, in the audience. And then they would report back to one central person who runs the whole show and say, Anthony talked too long before drinking, before offering us a glass of wine. Like, <laughs> you know, Anthony, Anthony got into a great story, but it's 10 minutes in and we're still not drinking. And you're like, oh, like, and I would get these, you know, polite correctives, like, just remember, people are here to drink. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, wow, like, so sorry to entertain you when you're thirsty. <laughs> so today's rule is, okay, I want to talk about this wine, but I know we're all thirsty. So let's Let's do it right now. We're going to take a sip together, but I demand that we do it together. And I joke that I'm a victim of 18 years of Catholic school. So we will all follow the rules here. No going ahead of me. But let's take the first sip together, knowing that the first sip never counts because whatever's on your palate before this, whether it's another glass of wine, 
you just brushed your teeth, a cup of coffee, anything will make the first sip taste less than perfect. And you could call it, in my book, we would call it the rinse. But for polite company, let's call it the toast. So a cheers to Joe Janish for inviting us here today. Thank you for having us and cheers. And we all take a sip. And then I just say, no, don't judge it at all yet. I want you to remember these words. How many times in your life have you been offered a sip of something? This is a pre-COVID uh, suggestion, but in the old days, a friend would walk up to you and put a glass to your face and say, oh my God, this is amazing. Taste it. And you would taste it and you might have liked it and you might not have, but think I want you to think of all the not liking and remembering that that first sip tastes way, way off the mark. And when we get to wine two, you will know it because we have this as the baseline now. But let's take a sec second sip together. This one we're going to call the balance. So the first is the rinse, the second is the balance. Now your palate's ready. But I don't want you to, I don't want you to swallow. We are not having tea with the queen. <laughs> Let us take a sip and swish it all around like it's mouthwash. I want you to, I'm going to spin my finger like this. And then when I thumbs back, swallow and pay attention. And then we do that. And when we swallow, I say, okay, here it comes. And you literally feel the saliva rising from the back corner of your jawline until your tongue is flooded. And I say, if I don't swallow, I cannot speak. Let me do that. And then I swallow really quick. And I'm like, the tide keeps rising. You salivate and dissipate salivate and it dissipates. I go, this is the battle between fruit and acid in every white wine you've ever tasted. And right now, the acid is pretty aggressive. This is, you know, the first wine is always the most refreshing, the highest in acid. The acid will always win. Why should you care? You don't have to, but I'm telling you, it's my job to care because we are judging how well this wine balances and where we would place it in the order of things in a meal. Is this the porch pounder that we don't even think about? Is it the, the aperitif outside where it doesn't matter if we have nibbles or not? You could drink it alone. It's not going to overwhelm you. There's no big high oak quotient to this to make you, you know, feel like overwhelmed. We measure all this. In food writing, we don't write about acid. In wine writing, it's the all-important balancer. So right now, how many minutes, how, how far are we into this? If I were Kevin Zarelli, I'd say we're a minute and 30 in. Where's the wine right now? Where's the acid? I feel it riding up my cheeks. And you see people go like, oh my God, he's in my mouth. <laughs> I'm like, how about right behind your front lip, your top lip, you feel the gum line there? It's pulling, it's starting to pull. Acid is working into every corner and crevice of your mouth to find the fruit, to eradicate it. You will completely dry out eventually, whether it leaves you with a tart sensation or a nutty sensation, all depends on the wine and how it was made. But the end result is there will be no fruit left if you wait a full three minutes or so. But... At this point, I would ask all of you if you like this wine as is on just the balance, second sip. And then I'm like, you know, if, if, if some raise their hand, some are shy. I'm like, you don't have to answer. We haven't had enough to drink yet. But here's what I would say to you. If you like this as is, we're going to be friends. We have like tastes you already know. If you're being honest with me and you're not trying to please me because you think that you should say you like it because I picked it, although you really should. But if you're really being honest, I want to say something very sincere to you. I couldn't care less if you don't like this wine. And that makes people just guffaw because that's, again, the permission they want, right? I couldn't care less. And, and, and what that means is I am sincerely saying I am not here to judge your palate. You know your palate. I can't tell you what to like. However, I have one more curveball to throw at you. When I sent the, you know, if we're at a tasting where there's cheese in front of you, or if it's a virtual tasting, we asked, you know, either the client will send you know, Murray's cheese boxes to everybody, or I'll just send instructions, raid the pantry, raid the fridge, cut up some salami or, or so, you know, prosciutto and grab, grab the potato chips or nuts or anything, anything savory, salty, fatty. Take a bite of something right now. It doesn't matter what it is. There's no perfect pairing here. And then let's take another sip together and see what happens. And then we do it again. And I say, okay, everybody with me? Where's the, where's the acid? And it's gone. Or at least it's mitigated enough where it's, I go, it's, it has melded with the fat and it has changed the complete profile of the wine. Does it feel a little richer, a little rounder, a little softer, a little more plush? You know, tell me. And people start to relax and give in their, they give adjectives and they talk about it. A lot of people will be blown away. And it is, there's definitely the power of suggestion at play here, Joe. I'm not going to lie about that, but there's no trick. I didn't give them a specific wine that changes with salted nuts. It doesn't matter. And I can't control what they're eating anyway. So it really is. And I say, please, nothing spicy, no blue cheeses. Like here's some, you know, uh, some standard things that we would say, but like 
it's not a, it's not a trick. This happens with every wine you've ever been offered, but we're never paying attention to that. And this is one way to look at it. Now, the proof in the first sip never counting carries into wine number two. Grab wine number two and let's pour it. Now let's taste it. And the acid from wine number one completely screws up number two, always. <laughs> and I say, now do you see what I'm talking about? Imagine how many times in your life you have tasted something on one sip and said, no, thank you. But myself included. Yeah. That just changes everything. So it's why I am now giving you permission to trust your palate, please. But also the next time you're at a party and they're offering four different wines, but you go to the one you, own, I only like Pinot Noir or I only like Sauvignon Blanc. Would you please take advantage of the free offerings and taste each one of them a couple of times with the snacks that they're passing around? And it's not to get you buzzed. It's sips, not chugs. But do that and you might actually find that, oh my gosh, I never really liked Chardonnay, but this one actually tastes good. And well, I would never go near a Cabernet, but this one actually tastes good because you've given it the three sip test and it changes everything. So if you honestly say after tasting wine number one with me that you don't like it to sip on the third sip with food, congratulations. You are firmly in control of your palate and your judgment. Let's move on. I'm done trying to sell this. And I don't get any money from selling this to you anyway. I picked this wine because I like it. I didn't make it. You can't hurt my feelings. And I don't get a commission on it. So let's move on. And you just, I'm just telling you, you see people... The, 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 it's like if you could see their hair going down, but you see their shoulders relaxing. People lean forward and they, they're interested. They're really interested in that because all of a sudden they're tasting it completely differently. No one ever does this. And I find, you know, sommeliers have snickered at me, master psalms are like, oh, you know, so pedantic and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, great. You can call what you want. But I get people to really, really give it a second and a third thought that they would never have given it before. And, and it also just led, lends for so many areas of discovery and discussion that can start from that. Yeah, and it, it's such a great tip to tell people to be on the first tip. You know, I, I never even thought of it myself. What you said is people, somebody said, oh, taste this, it's really good, right? And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, it's really good. And I'm just agreeing with them because, you know, they're, they're so excited to have found a wine that they like. Right. And you have inspired me when people have, like I've offered wine to people and, and they taste it and, and they... You know, they have that look on their face. They're like, oh, yeah, this is good. And I look at their face and I'm like, you don't really like it, do you? And they're like, oh, you know, it's OK. And then I tell them, I'm not the winemaker. You're not <laughs> going to offend me. Right, exactly. So like, you know, maybe if someone is actually having a tasting with the winemaker, maybe you don't want to tell them <laughs> you don't like the wine. But if it's anybody else or if it's just your friends or yeah. and they're just saying, hey, you like, you know, look, you don't have to like what I like. The, the other side of that, Joe, is that when people say uh, people just like you pour them something and like, I'm not even, I'm not even on duty. <laughs> I'm with someone standing in my kitchen and I pour them a glass and they take a quick sip in the mid, you know, mid conversation and just say, oh, that's good. That's really good. And then just like, okay, please don't ask me anything about this or please don't, let's not talk about it. But, oh, that's good. That's really good. I'm like, but wait, you just, you just had one sip. Like, yeah, you, you can't judge it on that. And, and I, I refuse to believe that it is good on the first sip. It might be okay on the first sip, but it's never good on the, it's never perfect on the first sip. Right. That's the truth. Like once you get into, you know, if I can get into your head after this interview and it, I, it sticks with you, you can't, you can never go back to the, just taking one sip and saying, oh, that's great. Because it really, and if, it, and if you think it's great, it's only going to get a lot better on that second sip, the balance. Yeah. And you know, it, it's actually, to me, it's kind of like listening to a song for the very first time. Like sometimes you hear a song for the very first time and it's like, yeah, that's all right. But then like you, you hear it two or three more times and you're like, wow, I really like this song. And you're paying attention to it more, just like you are with wine. I think like paying attention is such a key thing, especially in the United States where people just like, like you said, chug, like they just, they just throw back the, the Coca-Cola or they, or they, they basically swallow their food. They don't even taste it. I think with wine, you, you really need to pay attention. And that, that's where like that second sip and that third sip come in where you're like, all right, now I'm going to be like, like if you're listening to like a, like a jazz song, like I'm I'm listening to the to the bass. I'm listening to the the drums. Like I'm paying attention to what's happening. I'm not just like one little sip and, and it's going right down to my down to my stomach. It's something where you need to pay a little attention to really enjoy it. And you know, you mentioned the food, and the food is such a game changer. But there, there's something that you and I disagree about a little bit. I know that you are not so much into the food pairing. I am I feel like I'm always on the quest to find the very perfect pairing not not that everyone has to but like for me it's kind of like what makes the thing that's fun with wine is kind of finding the the best wine with with whatever i'm eating tonight or whatever is in front of me 
We're not so philosophically divided on that. It's just that I know that that could become a really, really tricky situation because of the variables involved. And you can't just say a Cabernet and a steak are great together. And, and Joe, this is born out of the torture, the torture of trying to establish drinks.com, which doesn't exist. It existed in 2000 when Jim Gordon, Jim Gordon left the Wine Spectator and hired me as his right hand to start drinks.com. And I hired Jeffrey Lindemuth, who was a good buddy of mine, who moved to, uh, to New York from Pennsylvania to come work with me. And we had so much fun, but it was the summer of torture because Jim left it to us to figure out the algorithms. And we were you know, working with their tech department of how to plug in your recipe and we would spit out the wine. Now imagine. Oh my goodness. And it was, so let's start with that steak. What cut of steak is it? What's the fat quotient, right? Is it ribeye or is it filet mignon? Because the fat will change how, how the texture is and how it's cooked. Are you preparing it on the grill or in a pan? What kind of fat are you using? How are you seasoning it? Are you using anything hot, like spicy? Imagine, like, so like to say like, oh, it's like the whole dumb white wine with fish, red wine with meat kind of thing. Sure, that's a safe place to start. But I don't know, between you and me, and I say this as a colorblind man, that I never looked at a tuna steak and thought of white wine in my life, nor a salmon and thought, that's red, that's white wine. So like, I just think that's idiotic, but it's a safe place to start if you need one. But it turns it into then something that's a task, something that's achievable, but maybe maybe not achievable for you. Like it's something to, it's something to strive for. Like, great, if we could say it very simply, like shuck oysters, Poor Muscadet, great, or poor, <laughs> poor Chablis, great. But is it an oak-free Chablis that they chose? What if they chose the one in a hundred oaked Chablis that screws everything up? Did they put a little mignonette on there and screw things up? Or wait, they always squeeze a lemon on there. Should they have? Like there's variables that screw up everything. Is it a West Coast oyster, which I don't, I prefer East Coast a thousand percent for texture. I like my oyster to have a little snap to it. Like I like my street hot dog to have a little snap to it. I don't like the creamy West Coast oysters that sort of like dissolve on your tongue. Like what's it I'm thinking of? Um, sea urchin. Like I don't like that's a different feel and a different thing for something else. But again, I just think there's so many variables that can come into play here. I'd rather just say champagne, popcorn, <laughs> champagne, potato chips, but not barbecue. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I'm not saying that I, I live to dumb it down. Right. But I think there's a time and place to geek out, but it's got to be with, you know, with someone who's asking to, right? And I, you have to understand my audiences typically are consumers of all strata and stripe. And I always want to make the assumption that they know less than I do. And I don't want to make them feel any less intelligent than I than I am. Like, I mean, like that, that's, that's the goal. So like I could throw things out to like, oh my God, this right now, this Shebley I just showed you, holy cow, this would be great with oysters. But then someone's going to send me a letter later saying like, so I tried the oysters and it really didn't work out. And then I have to ask 10 questions, East or West, mignonette, lemon, what did you do to this oyster to change the pairing? Like that could affect everything. Meaning that then, you know, then it becomes this another lesson and me blathering on about something else. Cause I don't know if you've noticed, but I, I can blather without even breathing. <laughs> well, it's, you know, you're talking about all this and you just reminded me, you mentioned Kevin Zarelli before. I remember, of course, he was my mentor as well. One of the things he once mentioned in one of our classes was like the very best match for a, a steak, like a big juicy ribeye steak could very well be a big oaky California Chardonnay. And when he said that, I was like, what? What is he talking about? Yeah. And it probably took me 15 years before I actually did it because I just happened to have a big oaky Chardonnay available and there was a ribeye in front of me. And I was like, all right, whatever. I'm just going to see how it is. And it, it worked. It was magical. And to your point, like, like I said, like I always try to find the best wine for the best food. But if it works, it works. Joe, this is a perfect tee up. I have been the online sommelier for Amex Platinum card holders for 18 years and going, I think. And it's actually, it's really funny because it's quite antiquated the way it works now versus, versus, you know, 18 years ago when they started, where, you know, it, if you opt in through your Amex Platinum newsletter and into the food and wine something or other, the club, the connoisseur club, you have access to me. 
And the fine print says, Anthony will answer you within 48 hours. And then it goes through a filter and then to somebody else who then sends it to me. So it's like in the era of direct messaging and texting, people f- ping me all the time from, you know, from Twitter and Instagram, who I don't even know, versus these, you know, these esteemed platinum clients who have to go through like, you know, the switchboard to get connected to me. It's really funny, <laughs> right? Like, and, and, you know, like, and, and then I get, and I'm lucky if I get the mail or not, where there's versus something in my pocket that buzzes it's a, deck, a direct message from someone. So uh, one of the two I always throw out there when I talk, and I actually talk about this a lot of tastings, is the woman who wrote to me in a panic and I happened to catch it because I was in front of my computer at that moment. And it was, dear Anthony, oh my God, the steaks are on the grill and all we have is Chardonnay. I didn't realize it. Now what? <laughs> and that was that was like, oh my God, this is definitely pre-COVID. Um, this was the worst thing that could happen. And I, I stared at the, and I thought, how do I do this? And I wrote back, I'm like, dear so-and-so, the steaks are probably done by now. So it's decision time. And I see two clear paths. One is steak with water. The other is steak with Chardonnay. Personally, I would stick with the Chardonnay, but it's entirely up to you and your self-respect. I go, but if you need any justification, here's how I would sell it to you if this happened at a restaurant. When you order the steak frite, it always comes out with a medallion of herbed butter melting across the surface of the steak. Butter on the plate, butter on the steak, butter in the glass. If you're drinking, unless you're drinking Chablis, there is some degree of oak in that Chardonnay that will probably lend a buttery mouthfeel or sensation that I think will go beautifully with the steak, but I leave it up to you. And of course, she wrote a thank you letter the next day. The other funny one, though, is dude in men's room with wine list date waiting. No. And he sent a photo. <laughs> and he sent a photo no. that I had to unload. Like oh, I had to like gross. I had to click on it. But I didn't see it till the next morning. So the next morning I see it. He was in California. He wrote to me after like after bedtime, I guess. And I looked at I'm like, oh my God, there's a photo here. This could go it's a thousand directions. But I clicked on it and there was the photo of the tile floor and the menu, the wine list. And I just I didn't know what to say. So I wrote back and I wrote, dude, I'm so sorry I missed this. I have no idea what to tell you, except I hope you're, you, you didn't wake up alone. And that's all I could send to him. <laughs> he sent back the thumbs up emoji, which was, uh, so it was actually not too long ago that this happened. But that's what I'm saying. Like I get, people want, they want permission. They want, they want like, they want to know what to do. And, and there it is. Like there's your steak thing. Like I, I probably heard Kevin say that 25 years ago as well. But it, uh, yeah, like I, I'm the guy who says like, I also joke about the Cabernet lovers, which I don't know about you, Joe, but like in our in our world, there's a million Cabernet lovers. It's usually, and I joke, I say it's the Marlboro man of the consumers who are afraid to say they like rosé or even you know Sauvignon Blanc. Like I, I always joke, if I'm stuck in an elevator or in a conversation with a guy who doesn't want to talk about wine, he'd rather talk about football with me, he will say invariably. I like a good cab. Of course. And it says, that's the safest answer and it sounds brawny and tough. But the joke is like, Cabernet is so, so limiting with food. Yeah. I mean, what do you do with it? It's so, I go, and that, that's part of, that, that lends itself to another, uh, another conversation I have with people. And I say, the old world, new world paradigm. Beyond the fact that we Americans learn everything by the grape, where the new world we learn by the grape, we drink by the grape, we order by the grape, we think about wine by the grape. In Europe, it's addresses, all addresses, all senses of place. But let's talk about just the paradigm of how these wines are made and what they go with. European wines are, by design, less fruity, earthier, higher acid, more attractive to food. And by European diplomacy, you must have food and wine on the table. Wine and food together, they must be together. The American paradigm, wine is food. We expect our juicy, delicious wines to be juicy and delicious upon the first sip. Otherwise, I'm not interested. We consider wine to be something that we don't have to consider with food. Although geeks like us, of course, think of in those terms. But in the day to day, like I joked, like my mother, who when she used to vacuum at 11 in the morning on Saturday, would open a bottle of Chardonnay to get through the drudgery of all the housework. Like she wasn't drinking that Chardonnay to think about what it was going to be for lunch. It was just to get the job done. So like Americans, I, I, I joke, we, wine is food. New World wine especially is food. Cabernet? Is food. It's like you're chewing on that. It's like jerky. Like you, know, like you could you could literally chew on big fat American Cabernet. 
where does it leave you with food pairing? Not much to work with. So I always joke like, you know, for the cab lover, I have something to, to you know, to introduce to you. And like, I, sh- I try to show them like big Spanish juicy Bierzos or, you know, or, you know, of course Zinfandel too, but like, there's so many things we could do with that. But the food pairing part is always, always, always so tough for me that I try and just break it down to, you know, like, let's add some fat and see what happens. So like, of course, Cabernet responds great to steak, but there's a lot more going on behind that, that, you know, we could either talk about if you're really interested, if it's one-on-one, but with a group, I don't want to get that technical and get everybody lost again. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Now, there, there is one thing that I, I think you're pretty adamant about when it comes to uh, doing something right or wrong with wine, and that's temperature. Hey, listener, sorry to be so abrupt, but I decided to cut the conversation here because Anthony went off on a temperature tantrum that turned this into a two-part episode. So if you enjoyed the discussion up to this point and want to learn why temperature is so important to the enjoyment of wine, then be sure to hit the subscribe button and you'll get the rest of this conversation delivered automatically. In the meantime, for more about Anthony, check the show notes. And for more insider tips, please visit wine365.com. And remember, wine is food. It comes from a place. Enjoy it responsibly.